Greetings. My name's Terry Ingram. I'm a f former Florida police officer from South Florida. And this video contains valuable information on how to respond during any encounter with law enforcement or any government officials whatsoever. This includes code enforcement, uh, FBI, your local police department, the sheriff's department. I'm sure as most of you are aware, we live in a police state. And the only weapons we have at our disposal are regress of grievance through the court systems. I'm sure many of you are of the mindset that our court systems are corrupt. I'm here to tell you that they certainly are in some instances, but for the most part, if you understand the rules and you follow the procedure, you're going to get good results from using the legal system. There are certainly bad judges out there, and there are certainly good judges out there. But we also have access to the appellate courts, and we still have a chance to do something about taking back our country. And that starts with understanding your rights and understanding government's limitations and what government's sole purpose is, which is to protect our liberties, protect our right to contract, etc. And basically, stay out of our way. I'm sure most of you are aware that it's just the opposite. Government's encroaching on our lives more and more every day. So this video contains valuable information on how to respond during any police encounter, whether it's a traffic stop, whether you're on the street and a police officer decides he wants to question you, uh, whether it's a code enforcement officer, it makes no difference. There's a specific way to handle all of these encounters and if you follow these rules, you won't fall into the 90 percentile rule group, which simply means that 90% of all criminal and quasi-criminal convictions come from the arrestee's mouth. We have to learn what the Fifth Amendment says and what it means is to keep our mouth shut. Now the following statement, when you're confronted by an official, is probably the single most statement that you can absorb. It turns any investigation pointed at you and puts the burden back on the official or the law enforcement or police officer or whoever it might be. And that question is, in response to any question they have for you, how fast were you driving, uh, what are you doing, uh, do you have any drugs uh, or weapons uh, or dead bodies or uh, uh, bags of cocaine in your car, the response to that or any of those types of inquiries is what is the nature of your investigation. That simply means that as government, the officer is required to articulate his suspicion of your criminal activity. Otherwise, you have no responsibility to respond to him whatsoever. Now, there's three specific rules when confronted by government. Besides the question of what is the nature of your inquiry, the first rule is to don't say anything. The second rule is to keep your mouth shut. 
And the third word rule is to shut up. Learn how to breathe through your nose with your lips closed. For example, that's how to respond. Now, almost all of the evidence that's ever going to be used against you to convict you in a criminal action is going to be furnished by you. If the officer had enough information to incarcerate you, he would simply put the handcuffs on you, put you in the police car, and downtown you'd go. They're asking you questions to get you to make admissions or confessions. When a police officer asks you if you can search, if you can search your, your vehicle, the answer is no you may not. Not why do you want to, or I don't feel like it. It's no, absolutely no. Now, if the officer asks you questions about why you don't wish to let him search your vehicle, your response is because you don't have a Fourth Amendment search warrant on your person, and I don't want you involved in my private affairs period. And if they ask you if you have any guns or drugs or whatever the case on you, ask them the nature of their inquiry. Are you conducting a criminal investigation? If you're conducting a criminal investigation, then I'm going to invoke my Fifth Amendment rights not to speak with you. So do what you have to do and Permit me to go about my business. Now take the position from the beginning of any investigation that your case is going to eventually be decided by the United States Supreme Court. Of course it actually necessarily won't be, but you take that position by establishing facts that don't give the officer rise to consider what you are saying is acquiescence to his search. If he starts to search your vehicle, tell him stop searching my vehicle. Now obviously you can't stop him from doing anything he doesn't want to stop doing. However, I guarantee you if you tell him to stop searching your vehicle or tell him not to search your vehicle or tell him to get away from my vehicle, then he's going to stop. Unless, of course, he has probable cause to search, which would be under a condition where the officer had a view of contraband openly and notoriously apparent inside your vehicle. Under those conditions, he does not need a search warrant. Now what would happen, for example, if a police officer came up to you and he had a dog that was trained in sniffing drugs, marijuana, cocaine, dead bodies, whatever he was trained in doing, and the dog alerted to the presence of some contraband, like cannabis, for example, or what if he comes up to your window and you roll it down and, and uh, billows of smoke come out of your car and it's cannabis? Does that give him a right to search your car? The answer is unequivocally no. Those things may give rise to probable cause to go get a search warrant the dog alerting to the presence of marijuana or cocaine or whatever he's, he's alerting to may give the officer a rise to go get a search warrant. None of those conditions give him the right to conduct a search without your consent. Watch all of these cop shows and you'll find that 99.9% .9 of all these people who are stopped, the policeman asks, do you have any drugs or anything in your car? Do you have any contraband? And you'll find many of them after 
a little bit of questioning by the police going, yeah, I've got a little pot in my car, yeah, I got some in my glove box, etc. It's absurd. Stop making admissions and confessions. Answer their questions with, what's the nature of your inquiry? If they believe you have some, some contraband in your vehicle, ask them to articulate their suspicion of your criminal activity. The United States Supreme Court has stated that a police officer must articulate his suspicion of your criminal activity before he can even proceed under the doctrine of probable cause. And even proceeding under that doctrine only gives him ultimately the right to go and get a search warrant. There is no condition whatsoever that he has the right to search unless it's with your consent. And if you watch all, like I say, if you watch all these police shows, you're going to see that the vast majority of them simply cave in. The cop says, what do you got to hide? And the suspect will say, well, uh, I just don't want you to search my vehicle. And, uh, you know, I just uh, really don't want to give you permission. And you see the police officer browbeat. The, the suspect into giving his permission. The answer is what part of no don't you understand? I don't want you around me. I don't like you. I don't want you in my face. And I don't want you to deprive me of my liberty. Now articulate your suspicion of, of my criminal activity. Give me a citation, whatever it is you're here to do and go about your business and I'll see you in court. That's your response. Now, when defending yourself, prepare yourself to accept nothing short of total victory or total defeat. You're either gonna knock me out or I'm gonna knock you out, rhetorically speaking. Don't give up that position. If you wanna stop, the state bullies from bullying you and your friends, you have to learn how to say no. I don't want you in my life. I don't want to answer your questions. I don't want you around me and I want you to release me as soon as your official business is concluded. If that's a citation or whatever the case may be, fine, example. Uh, sir, do you know how fast you were going? What's the nature of your inquiry, officer? Well, I just want to know if you know how fast you're going. Are you conducting an investigation? Yes, I am, the officer says. Are you asking me to make an admission or a confession? Well, then he realizes that's exactly what he's doing. And if he says, yes, I'm asking you to, you say, well, I'm not going to give you an admission or confession. If you have reason to believe that I was speeding, issue me this citation and I'll see you in court. And that's another thing we have to stop doing. No matter how unreasonable it seems to you, we've got to start going to court for every single ticket, every single parking ticket, every single criminal issue you're compelled to in a, in a criminal case. We have to start clogging up these court systems so the money is taken away from the system. They count on 98 or 99 percent of us pleading out or paying our citations. If just three percent of the people in this country would plead not guilty, I don't care if you're guilty or not, just plead not guilty, go to court, demand a trial, the system would shut down. It would be overloaded and it would cease to exist. We have the power. Empower yourself. Learn your rights. Get on the internet. Google the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights, for the first time in most of your lives. Read those rights and you'll see exactly where all of these terms, probable cause, search and seizure, etc., come from. Okay, what is or is not 
a law can only be determined by the Constitution of the United States, not the legislature, not the police, not the officers in court. A large percentage of legislation is non-constitutional, just waiting to be challenged by an eager pro-per litigant, which is a person who represents themselves. Now, like I said, I teach a course on law and simple terms. I'm going to eventually be putting these courses for free on the internet, on the YouTube. I have about 60 separate classes that I teach that will help you in your civil and your criminal cases, and we can shut this system down if we just simply work together. You want to know what to do about what's going on in our country today? Start getting involved. Start exercising your rights. Stop giving up your rights. Okay, the ultimate source of all rights is the author of all things, not government. You notice that the founders of the Constitution did not use uh, phrases uh, very commonly like God or Christ or whatever the case may be because they wanted to make this an issue that the government understood that our rights came from some higher source, source other than government itself. This is not a matter of being uh, religious or invoking a, any, any deity. This is an issue that makes the government understand that the people are sovereign, the people have the rights, and the government and governments are subordinate to us. Rights come from somewhere else, some higher authority, not from government. Government is our servant. Government is our tool. Government is here to protect our liberties and protect our constitutional rights. The first 10 amendments are not what our rights are. They are a notice to the state and federal governments of what rights we hold nearest and dearest to us. We don't need laws to tell us what we can do. We can do everything. The government needs a law to tell us what we can't do. And there has to be certain criteria, which we won't get into during this video, on how they can even create a law. When you're speaking with, with a, with a uh, police officer or government official, Make no admissions, make no confessions, make no denials. Deny nothing, confess nothing, admit nothing. If they have information, they're not going to be bothering to ask you questions. They're just going to click, click, go to jail. If they see you stealing the apple, they're not going to go over and say, gee, why are you stealing this apple? They're just going to go and arrest you. However, if somebody alerts them to the fact that you just stole an apple, well, they're going to go over there and try to get you to make an admission or confession that you, in fact, stole the apple because the incident did not occur within the purview of the officer. And as some of you may or may not know, a police officer may not make a misdemeanor arrest if it's not committed in his presence. He may only make a felony arrest and he needs to have articulable suspicion of criminal activity and it has to rise to a level of probable cause, not just mere suspicion. Okay, let's do a little role play here. A police detective arrives at your home and he relates to you that your vehicle was involved in a minor fender bender at the local shopping mall. You mistakenly answer the door instead of talking to him through the window or through the door. Never open your door to the police ever because they can consider that an invite into your house. 
And so you mistakenly answered the door without asking the person to identify themselves. And now you find yourself outside the front of your door, face to face with the detective. The detective says he wants to see your license and registration and proof of insurance and to ask you a few questions regarding the damage to your motor vehicle, which is parked right there in your driveway. You're the suspect. Remember the rules. Don't speak. Shut up. Keep your mouth shut. What requirements do you have under that particular condition to show the police officer your driver's license, to show him proof of insurance? Now, he sees a car in the driveway on his little computer. He's run the tag on the computer, and it's come back to your name, and you mistakenly identified yourself to the officer, so he knows that that motor vehicle belongs to you and that the paint transfer of the other motor vehicle matches the paint transfer on the car where your car is damaged. So you can pretty much put two and two together. Now what are your requirements to respond to any of his questioning whatsoever or what is your requirement to give him identification, proof of insurance, or your registration. Zero. Nothing. Nothing requires you to speak to that man. You may tell him to go away, conduct your investigation, but you'll get nothing from me. Goodbye. End of case. There's only one circumstance where you're required to produce identification in this country it's a case called Brown versus Texas, United States Supreme Court, 1968, decided this case absolutely. And even as a police officer in, uh, in uh, South Florida, we once had an ordinance that required people to produce identification upon demand to a police officer. There is no such law. There's only one condition, and that's if you're operating a motor vehicle. If you're the passenger in a motor vehicle, you are not required to speak to the police or identify yourself. If you were stopped by a police officer and you were the passenger, you have every right to get out of the car and start hoofing it down the road and there's not a thing they can do about it. So remember, Browns versus Texas, Google it. This was a case in El Paso, Texas, where a black gentleman refused to give his identification to the police, and they arrested him. This is not Nazi Germany. This is still the United States of America, believe it or not. So there's no condition. If you're walking down the street, whatever the case may be, cop says, let me see your ID. Answer is no, you may not see my ID. Not why do you want to see it, uh, what's going on, what's happening. The answer is certainly if he asks you, he says, may I see your ID? No. Or give me your ID? No. He has absolutely no right to do that whatsoever. The only time, like I say, is when you're operating a motor vehicle. Okay, so in the instance where the officer is, is uh, uh, trying to question you about the accident that happened, at the mall and he's at your door and you're face to face with him, what is he doing? He's looking to get admissions or confessions from you. Is he not? Exactly. Now if you want to go ahead and confess crimes, the Supreme Court even says people like to f confess crimes. Some people do it. That's okay if they want to. But there's no requirement to speak to the police under any circumstance even if you have to give them your identification when you're operating a motor vehicle, you still have no requirement whatsoever to utter one single word to a police officer, period. And you are going to always, almost always, be better off not answering their questions or speaking to them. And if they start harassing you, get their badge number, go down to the police department, and make a complaint with Internal Affairs. I teach people how to file 
and prosecute, false arrest, false imprisonment. That's a very powerful tool. And we are very successful at doing that. In future videos, I'll be showing you and giving you information and giving you boilerplate complaints on how to do exactly that and you just simply have to apply it to uh, your, your community. Next video we'll be covering a uh, different subject matter. I haven't decided what that's going to be yet but I hope this was informational and if any of you folks happen to be around Davie, Florida we have classes on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Uh, first come first serve and uh, we speak about different subject matters uh, uh, at every class so uh, if you have any questions or comments you can contact me by the number you're going to see on the screen and also you can contact my meetup uh, site and my website which is hopefully also going to be on the screen this time so I thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, we'll talk to you next time.